Good evening. My name is John Earl, the Marlene and David Grissom Professor of Social Studies at Center College. On behalf of President Milton Moreland, Dean Ellen Gordy, and the college, I wish to welcome you, whether you are with us in person or viewing remotely, to this evening's public lecture with Mr. Peter Canellis. Peter Canellis is managing editor for Enterprise at Politico, where he oversees the site's magazine, investigative journalism, and major projects. He has also been Politico's executive editor, overseeing the newsroom during the 2016 presidential coverage. He has also served as page editor at the Boston Globe. A native of Boston, Peter is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia Law School, where he spent, he spent much of his career at the Globe, where at various points he oversaw the paper's local news coverage and the Washington DC Bureau. He has also edited the Globe's book, Last Lion, The Fall and Rise of Ted Kennedy, which was a top 10 New York Times bestseller in 2009. The book set the stage for much of the analysis of Kennedy's career following his death and supplied most of the anecdotes for President Obama's eulogy of Kennedy. For the past 12 years, Peter has worked with the International Women's Media Foundation overseeing the Elizabeth Neufer Fellowship, which is awarded to a woman journalist from around the world to study human rights at MIT and intern at the Globe and New York Times. He has also traveled overseas on human rights trips with the United States Holocaust Museum, International Reporting Project, and the Robert Bosch Foundation. As an editor, Peter has overseen two Pulitzer Prize-winning projects, along with five others that were Pulitzer finalists. As a writer, he was a recipient of the American Society of Newspaper Editors Award in 2011 for excellence in editorial writing. Peter joins us this evening following the publication of his most recent book, The Great Dissenter, the story of John Marshall Harlan, America's judicial hero, published with Simon & Schuster earlier this year. In exploring the life and times of Center alumnus and Danville native, Justice John Marshall Harlan, who served on the bench between 1877 and 1911, Peter does much more than tell a story of the Supreme Court in post-bellum Gilded Age America. It is a book that reminds us of the power of biographical writing, of the possibility of prose to introduce us to a world of change, contradiction, and legal outcomes that were seldom foredrawn conclusions. The Great Dissenter begins by asserting there are silences in American history. The book then ends with the following three words, equal under law. In between historical silence and claims concerning legal equality stood John Marshall Harlan and the story of a deeply divided state and country. That Kentucky birthed the two respected presidents of the Civil War, born within 100 miles of each other, Abraham Lincoln outside of Hodgenville and Jefferson Davis in Fairview, reminds us of the state's contentious contours fractured by slavery secession, and white supremacy. As the great dissenter shows, the eras of reconstruction in Jim Crow also constituted a moment when black Americans, such as Robert James Harlan, sought to create new forms of international citizenship and economic mobility. Harlan's was a career that intersected with competing economic visions for the country during industrialization, questions concerning migrant labor, colonial empires, and his own personal hardships. Peter, as we welcome you to this stage, we express our immense gratitude for the time that you have spent with us over the past two days. Your book reminds us that the past is not merely prologue. It is, has been suggested, a world of silences. And for giving voice to histories that have been hushed, we thank you. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Peter Canellis. <laughs> 
Wow, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, John, Professor Earl, for that uh, amazing introduction. Um, and I want to express my gratitude to everybody who's here and everybody at Center College who's been so phenomenally welcoming the last two days. Uh, and I also want to thank, uh, well, first of all, the people who helped organize this, uh, uh, this visit from uh, the trustee Ben Beaton to the uh, dean, Ellen Goldie, and Professor Benjamin Knoll, and many, many others uh, who put a lot of time into this visit. I, I deeply, deeply appreciate it. What I mostly appreciate, though, is the chance to talk to all of you at a place uh, that, first of all, mattered so much to John Marshall Harlan himself, uh, but also a place where uh, his memory is, is preserved. I uh, was incredibly honored to be able to visit his fraternity last night and to see two oil paintings on the walls, one of uh, Justice Harlan as a, civil right, as a Civil War officer and the other as a uh, member of the Supreme Court. So it's, uh, it's amazing to think that there is a place here in the world where, uh, where Harlan is known, Harlan is revered, Harlan is respected and, uh, and remembered. Um, and I'm honored to be able to contribute to that because I, I share your admiration for Justice Harlan and I found that in researching this book, uh, my admiration for him only, only grew. People often ask, well, what is it that attracted you? You know, I'm not from Center College, I'm not from Danville, I'm not from Kentucky. What attracted you to, uh, to Justice Harlan? And what I would say is that um, what I know and what you know of the years that he was on the Supreme Court from 1877 to 1911, what the average person kind of remembers of those years was two things, one, <clears throat> It was the start of segregation, which bedeviled this country and has bedeviled this country for more than a century. Uh, second is that it was a time of uh, tremendous income inequality, historic income inequality. You know, today <clears throat> we uh, go and visit the houses in Newport and Long Island and along the Hudson River, these giant mansions that were built to model the chateaus of Louis XIV. And we marvel at the fact that people could be so wealthy. Um, and on the other hand, many of us, those of us who have immigrant ancestors, remember our own grandparents talking about you know, living four and five to a room even though everybody's working. And you think, how, how did that come to pass? And then uh, you, you read the history of the Civil War and you understand that there was a tremendous uh, effort and intention to pass the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of the uh, to the U.S. Constitution to guarantee equal protection under the law to African Americans, a and yet we know that for hundreds of years there was no such thing in this country. Well, you say, well, how did these how did these things come to pass? It's now been 150 years. You know, we know we know the effects of what happened during that era. You know, was it uh, that there were terrible presidents during that era? Well. You know, there it wasn't a, a murderer's row, so to speak, of, uh, of presidents, but I don't think it was primarily the fault of uh, Benjamin Harrison or Chester Arthur or uh, Rutherford B. Hayes or William McKinley, nor do I think it was primarily the fault of Congress, uh, which actually did take action at crucial moments. Rather, it was the fault of the Supreme Court. So when you try to say, how did these terrible things come out of that era, the answer to how that happened is, well, U.S. Congress actually passed a sweeping Civil Rights Act in 1875, but the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional. The 15th Amendment actually guarantees voting rights to all Americans, but the Supreme Court declared it to be unenforceable. State legislatures stepped in to order, uh, uh, you know, uh, various forms of civil rights, they were declared unconstitutional as well. In the case of Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, the uh, Supreme Court endorsed the legal architecture of segregation. If you then say, well, okay, how did all the economic inequality come about? Well, the U.S. Congress actually passed an antitrust act, the Sherman Antitrust Act, but the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional. It passed an income tax, but the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional. 
Then in this seminal case of Lochner v. New York, the Supreme Court declared that any form of labor regulation also is per se unconstitutional. The common thread in all of those decisions is John Marshall Harlan dissented in them. In the majority of them, he was the only dissenter. So if you study the law today, or you study it as I did in the late 1980s, you have to ask the question, how did this one person who was such an outlier in his time, who was so out of the mainstream, considered, in the words of one Supreme Court justice, an eccentric exception to everything? How could he have been so right and so modern in his thinking? You know, what is it that made him so right? If you, uh, if you could bottle it, you know, this would be the source of wisdom in uh, jurisprudence and in judging. And the answer, I think, is a series of life experiences that he had and values, and they all pretty much trace to this state of Kentucky, and some of them trace to this institution of, of Center College. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what John Marshall Harlan knew and saw and how it led him to see things differently on the Supreme Court, differently from his northern colleagues. He was born in uh, 1833 and uh, born into a family of uh, Whig politicians. His father was a Whig politician uh, and a great adherent of Henry Clay, who many of you know was uh, probably the greatest statesman of his era, but also certainly the greatest Kentuckian of his era, uh, who served in uh, the Senate and the House and was a presidential candidate four times and uh, uh, spent decades trying to prevent this looming civil war that dominated his career. For John Harlan, uh, who was very attuned to national politics through his father and through Henry Clay, his entire life was shadowed by this looming threat of civil war. Folks in Kentucky, folks in Danville, could look to the South and they would hear people like John C. Calhoun talking about states' rights and talking about the importance of uh, slavery and secession. They could look north and they would hear abolitionists talking about the absolute necessity of ending slavery. And what they saw here was a mortal threat to their own state, both because of geography where it would be the, the physical you know, locus of the fight and be physically destroyed, but also in terms of its civic culture because they knew that one of the great problems in Kentucky was that it's 50% slave, pro-slave, pro-southern, and pretty much 50% pro-northern and pro-free. So if this civil war ever came, it would destroy Kentucky. That's why Henry Clay and the Harlans and others tried to craft a series of compromises to limit the geographical spread of slavery, put slavery on a path to eventual uh, termination, uh, but avoid a civil war. That was the, largely the work of the Whig Party. It was the work of Henry Clay. Uh, it was the work of his adherents, including in early days, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it was the work of James Harlan. It was the work of John Marshall Harlan. This is what John Marshall Harlan grew up believing. He also grew up believing in the importance of a national destiny for the United States as opposed to a state destiny and the importance of the law over politics. He was named for the great Chief Justice John Marshall who asserted judicial review. It was John Marshall who said the US Supreme Court will interpret the Constitution and not the US Congress. Therefore, law supersedes politics. Growing up in that environment where politics all around you is threatening disunion and war and dismemberment, uh, that was a very comforting thought for John Harlan and it was a comforting thought for his father. And when his father named him John Marshall Harlan, he sort of was putting this sort of unconscious prophecy on this boy that he wanted this boy, like all of his sons, he wanted them all to be lawyers uh, like himself and, and he believed so strongly in the Supreme Court that the unconscious prophecy was that someday John Marshall Harlan would one day follow in the footsteps of the great Chief Justice John Marshall. Now in this home out at Harlan Station, 10 miles away from here, there was another Harlan, Robert Harlan, who lived there, who was a fantastic and amazing figure. This Harlan, who was 16 years older than John, uh, was an African American, and he was technically enslaved in the house, 
I say to legally enslaved in the house, uh, but treated like a member of the family. He too was somebody that James Harlan tried to get educated and dreamed of being a lawyer, but because he was an African American, he wasn't allowed to go to school. Now, paradoxically, that may have freed Robert Harlan to live a different kind of life. Uh, all of James Harlan's sons were uh, put in this sort of cloistered atmosphere of study where James's great dream of creating a family law firm was front and center. They were all going to learn the law. Robert was forbidden from learning the law, but it enabled him to do things like uh, become a pioneer in horse racing, through which he developed this unerring eye, really unique for his time, of finding opportunities, even in a time of slavery, where African Americans could succeed. So Robert figured out that in this brand new sport of horse racing, there were a lot of black people involved. The reason was that uh, the slave owner, uh, the initial uh, horse owners were also uh, slave owners, and they had the enslaved men, their enslaved men, serve as jockeys and trainers. Uh, many of the accounts of Kentucky during that period would talk about these races that would take place in rural areas as being uh, checkerboards because they were half black and half white. Robert Harlan understood sort of innately that this was a place where, where he could succeed despite the enormous impediments that he faced being, uh, being African American and being enslaved. Now, um, from the horse racing, uh, You've got to envision young John Harlan, you know, little boy, seeing Robert, who was dashing, who was handsome, who was tough, who carried a gun to try to stage races, and you had to be tough to enforce uh, betting winnings and things like that. Robert would come home at night, this charismatic figure, living this very different life from the other Harlan men, uh, usually with a leather po pouch full of money. Um, and from there, Robert, like, figured out other ways, uh, other places where African Americans could make money, like the gold rush. He innately understood that, you know, 1849, go to California, that's a place where people are coming in from all around the world. Old thinking about race doesn't apply there. So he hightailed it over to San Francisco, which in that time meant taking a steamboat all the way down the Mississippi River, going to Panama, crossing a jungle, and a mountainous jungle at that, taking a rickety boat up the uh, coast of the United States through famously difficult waters, getting into uh, San Francisco Bay, abandoning the boat, <laughs> and having to go to the gold rush. Well, he came back with the equivalent of four or five million dollars, which uh, was worth, uh, worth even more in his time than this time, uh, and, and made another very smart, fateful decision, which was to get out of Kentucky, which was still a slave state, and go to Cincinnati, which at that time was the terminus of the Underground Railroad. This was before the Fugitive Slave Act. So there were all these black people coming out of slavery and into Cincinnati. It was quite a fertile environment. And he used his money to invest in black-owned businesses. They included things as simple as a grocer underneath a building that he owned, but also things as innovative and pioneering as, as photography. And the African-American photographers of the 1850s were the leading pioneers in photography in the United States, and a lot of them were funded by Robert Harlan. He also owned the mortgage on a hotel called the Dumas House, which was the fashionable establishment for free black people coming off of steamboats in Cincinnati, but also in its sort of catacomb-like basement is where fugitives uh, later, fugitive slaves and runaways from the Underground Railroad were later hidden. So Robert Harlan had this amazing life. It was also very much reputed and rumored during that time that Robert was John's brother. And it was published in newspapers, it was stated widely, it was uh, kind of an open secret, and it was something that John obviously would have heard and would have known. But I think that in John's mind, probably the greater image was like watching this, this man, 16 years old, this sort of uncle figure, who led this amazing life and then went on to great riches, riches which he continued to share with the Harlan family and to maintain a personal relationship with people in the Harlan family. That was one 
Kentucky experience that made a big difference on John Harlan, I think, in the way that he later on viewed African Americans. Another one, obviously, was fear of the Civil War and the compromises that he and Henry Clay and others were trying to, to affect. And the fact that those compromises pretty much ended with the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court, which was a, a monstrous decision that went way beyond even the facts of the case to make bold declarations of how no black people, even free black people, could ever have rights under the US Constitution. And it was wrongheaded too, because when the Constitution was founded in many states, black people did have uh, equal rights. Um, it also declared the Missouri Compromise, which was Henry Clay's great achievement, unconstitutional. It was at that moment that John Harlan, I think, realized that all these compromises they were fighting for weren't gonna work, and a civil war was gonna come, and potentially Kentucky was gonna get destroyed. So it gave him this powerful sense of the finality and the, uh, the, the, the incredibly important stakes of Supreme Court decisions so that thereafter he would always view the Supreme Court as, and Supreme Court decisions as, as having mortal consequences and enormous power over the direction uh, and the trajectory of the United States and also tremendous power over average people's lives. That was a decision that came, or that was a, a realization that came strictly from his life experiences here in Kentucky. What he also believed, and this is where Center College comes in strongly, was he combined all of this with a sense of American exceptionalism, what we today would call American exceptionalism, which was an, an innate understanding that what was going on in the United States was special and historically different from the world that he had been born into. All of the other countries that he could look at had monarchies or other forms of totalitarian government. America, he recognized, was this experiment in self-government, this almost sort of sacred experiment in self-government. And that was a view that was reinforced not just by his father and the Whig Party, but it was something that I think was part of the fabric of the education at Center College. At Center College, there was, uh, students were encouraged to think very broadly at that time about national events. And given that we're talking about him graduating in, in uh, 1850, you know, and the Civil War starting just 10 years later, it's no surprise that, you know, national events were, were front and center in, uh, in the center education at that time. It was also, as you all know, a devout Presbyterian uh, school uh, and run by John C. Young, who was his childhood minister and then, of course, became an important figure in his life when he was a student here. It was also a place where students were encouraged to practice oratory, believing that their ability to communicate with words, that words mattered, that this was the way to influence the world was to be able to, to uh, articulate yourself and articulate your views. Uh, so during his weeks at Center College, during every week, he had to engage in debates. He had to engage in public address. He had to learn how to hold an audience. You know, at that time, I think it was like a lot like debates go on in college now, but even more perhaps like theater goes on in college now where you really have to uh, keep an audience entranced and that's the way to persuade them. And I think that Center College training also led him to immediately outstrip his father in one respect. He always worshiped his father, but his father was known as a terrible speaker, a brilliant lawyer, but a terrible speaker, and therefore limited as a politician. From the time that John was in his early 20s as a, as a newly minted Center graduate, he was traveling the state of Kentucky and drawing huge crowds because he was so handsome and charismatic and able to hold a crowd. So I think among the lessons that he learned at Center were not just the, the performance skills that made his later career possible, but also the vital importance of argument, the vital importance of being able to, to articulate your views, which is something that came into play when he made it onto the Supreme Court. Now, to jump ahead a bit, Harlan uh, remained loyal to the Union during the Civil War. He fought to, uh, to keep Kentucky neutral to the point of like standing on street corners in Louisville with a bullhorn imploring people not to, jo to, to have the state join the Confederacy. He talked about sleeping in the corridors of the old state capital in Frankfurt uh, 
in fear that there would be political deals cut by the then governor of Kentucky, Beriah McGoffin, who was a, uh, uh, who was a, a Confederate sympathizer. Uh, the Louisville Courier Journal, the dominant statewide newspaper, had an editor, a man named Prentice, who was a legendary figure, whose wife and sons were open con uh, Confederate sympathizers, and the fear was that this newspaper was going to become uh, an agitator for, for the Confederate cause. And Harlan played a role in getting to the owner of the newspaper to essentially defang Prentice. And the feeling was that John Harlan wrote some of the editorials that were appearing in the uh, Courier Journal while Prentice was declared to be sick and absent from his job. Um, he even took caches of guns um, sent down by the Lincoln administration out of, you know, to create the secret, secret weapons cache to uh, protect the state in case the Confederacy decided to invade. Um, then spent several years in the military, bringing, building up his own regiment and being an incredibly popular and heroic military officer. He came out of the war as the Attorney General of Kentucky, but then politics got difficult for Kentucky after the war. He felt, Harlan felt, and almost every person in Kentucky felt that the state was being uh, mistreated by the federal government, that it had stayed loyal, it had stayed initially neutral and then completely loyal to the, to the Union cause. But the Lincoln administration and then the Andrew Johnson administration didn't follow through on their promises to Kentucky to allow Kentucky to control its destiny. So at a very troublesome period when he was the attorney general, he felt obliged to defend Kentucky's interests by opposing ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which is something that would always sort of linger as a, a, a question mark in his career later on. But then, within a couple of years, as he saw, again, his experiences in Kentucky taking a different turn as the Ku Klux Klan and other groups of white marauders began taking control of the state and terrorizing not just the black community, but many other people, white people as well, trying to take over the state and uh, uh, enforce its own racist agenda, he grew more and more radically opposed to this. It was horrifying to him. You know, he had grown up in a state that he believed to be an aristocratic kind of uh, a visionary place, a place where education and progress were rewarded. After the Civil War, he felt that Kentucky was backsliding terribly. When he saw things like the Ku Klux Klan developing, he saw that the old dynamic that had almost destroyed the state under slavery was being recreated again. And so he made a very fateful shift where he became a member of the Republican Party, which essentially ended his career in state politics, even though he ran for governor as a Republican, because the Republicans just weren't popular in Kentucky. He was personally popular, the Republicans were not. But he became a, an adherent of the Republican ideology and began going around the state saying that he himself had tried to, tried to force compromises that would have allowed slavery to continue, but there's no man in this country more happy than I am, said John Harlan, that uh, slavery no longer exists, that the bright sun of freedom no longer you know, has the dark cast of slavery on, on some of our fellow citizens. He then became a Supreme Court justice out of his loyalty to the Republican Party, partly but also as a product of the 1876 presidential election, which was a disputed election. And as many of you know, there were dueling electors that were sent up by three southern states. Republicans controlled the lever of government and wanted Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican candidate, to take office. But there were a series of sort of behind the scenes deals that were cut with Democrats with the idea of keeping uh, the parties, uh, keeping some semblance of order among the parties. One of the promises was to appoint a southerner to the Supreme Court, which was heretofore all northerners. The problem for Hayes was that the U.S. Senate was still controlled by the so-called radical Republicans who were all progressives and supporters of civil rights. So he had to appoint somebody who was authentically a Southerner, but he also had to appoint somebody who was perceived as supportive enough of civil rights to, uh, uh, to be acceptable to the radical Republicans controlling the Judiciary Committee. And it was very doubtful. Many people wrote letters saying John Harlan changed his stripes before the war. He was 
you know, totally against abolition. Now he's condemning slavery. What's he going to do tomorrow? He's a total opportunist. Don't trust this man. And at that moment, he received crucial support from, among other people, Robert Harlan, who grew up in his own home, had reemerged as the leading black politician in Ohio, had real power because Ohio was the pivotal state in presidential elections and the black vote was what threw Ohio to the Republicans. If, if African American voters didn't keep supporting Republicans, Democrats would win uh, Ohio and carry the presidential race. So Robert Harlan had tremendous clout. The New York World said at that point, second only to Frederick Douglass is the influence of Robert Harlan in this country. And Robert Harlan worked behind the scenes and worked overtly to promote John for the court. So we don't know, you know what was in everybody's mind at the time and stuff, but I think the fact that somebody who grew up in the same home, grew up enslaved in the same home, was saying, you can trust this man, uh, made a big difference in, in getting John Marshall Harlan onto the Supreme Court and getting him confirmed. Thereafter, he was taking a seat on the court at a fateful moment in U.S. history. The post-Civil War amendments that he had initially opposed, but then strongly supported, and then became ratified and part of the Constitution, so he was backing it as part of the Constitution himself, uh, were being interpreted for the very first time on a whole range of issues. And it gave unusual new importance to the U.S. Supreme Court. So there you had Harlan, who had been appointed the product of this weird circumstance of the disputed presidential election and the need to appoint a Southerner sitting on a court with eight Northerners who are all in their own careers, railroad attorneys and representatives of these Gilded Age trusts. Harlan, as we know, had been born in 1833. Other men who were born during that time were coming of age at a time when being a lawyer meant hanging a shingle on your door and helping your neighbors with legal disputes and writing wills and you know, defending people in court if necessary. Uh, when the railroads began dominating the US economy in the 1850s and all transportation was controlled by the railroads, the entire economy changed and producers of various products would cut exclusive monopolistic deals with with railroads to get their products in the hands of these fast-growing communities in the West and to cut out their competitors. And it led to this tremendous sort of corporatization of the US economy, something that many people in the North supported that led to great riches on Wall Street, led to these amazing, huge fortunes. But it also created a requirement for corporate attorneys to go to state legislatures and courts to try to defend the rights of these great combinations uh, that were being challenged uh, politically and legally on various grounds. So this class of like dynamic corporate attorney, brilliant corporate attorney emerged suddenly and with so much money at stake, they were paid fantastically. They became as wealthy as the moguls who owned those same combinations and they too built castles along the Hudson River and they too lived on Fifth Avenue. And they also got appointed to the Supreme Court because after Abraham Lincoln, for 40 years, there was an unbroken string of pro-business conservatives in the White House appointing Supreme Court justices. They were all Republicans and uh, the so-called Bourbon Democrat, Grover Cleveland, who was from New York and was pro-Wall Street. So Harlan is there on the court with all of these fantastically wealthy, certified, brilliant fellow justices but who embodied a lot of the prejudices of the Gilded Age that the average person, including people in Kentucky and Westerners who felt themselves to be so disadvantaged by this monopolistic system controlling wages and prices um, that was dominating the country. So in all of these decisions, interpreting the new powers granted to the US Constitution, the importance of federal citizenship and all this, John Harlan found himself at odds with his colleagues. He didn't really intend it to be that way. And his first six years on the court, he was sort of the dutiful junior member. But when the civil rights cases of 1883 came along, challenging the civil rights of the Federal Civil Rights Act, he broke with his colleagues in a very fundamental way and essentially never came back. Um, the civil rights cases of 1883 in his lifetime and in his mind were greater even than Plessy v. Ferguson as sort of a national crucible. 
uh, there were a collection of cases, both including the North and South, in which African Americans tried to uh, get access to meals in restaurants, to space in inns, to places in railroad cars, and were denied their legal rights. It became a huge case and incredibly well known around the country. Unlike Plessy v. Ferguson years later, which was hardly known to anybody, this was like a national crucible. In Atlanta, they would interrupt a theater production to give updates on the case. And when it was finally declared that uh, the Civil Rights Act had been declared unconstitutional, they stopped the performance and in the orchestra seat where all the white people were, there was cheering and people jumping around and there was tears and pain in the balcony where black people were relegated. At that moment, Harlan, there was pressure on uh, Harlan, I think, to make the case unanimous, but he, he refused to do so, um, thereby angering a lot of his colleagues, uh, but thereby winning the strong endorsement and support of Frederick Douglass and many other uh, great African-American leaders. He continued his advocacy for African-Americans in almost every case thereafter, uh, and his opinions became more and more eloquent. Finally, in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, he wrote sort of a perfectly distilled uh, dissent that sort of really spoke to foundational principles in American law. And those of you who are lawyers, those of you who are studying law have to know how unusual it is to read a legal opinion that goes as, as deep into the national character and the national charter and the importance of the United States' uh, founding principles as Harlan's dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson. He said, the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. There is no caste here. You know, these are great sentiments that really should be you know, etched on the side of a building or be part of a, a great memorial somewhere. And in writing those words, and having written other dissents in racial cases, including his famous dissent in the civil rights cases of 1883, he not only um, expressed his deep principled opposition to something that was going to destroy the United States. This was arguably the darkest moment in American law. And there is one person saying, no, the Constitution believes in equality among citizens. One person stood there. And I believe the difference between none and one was absolutely essential in maintaining faith in the US Constitution and the US government system. We now know what we didn't know for so many years because African American papers, which are largely ignored in the white community, had become digitized. And what we know is that while you know, the white community wasn't paying attention, black leaders were parsing Harlan's words very closely. It was widely discussed in African-American newspapers. The, the substance of his dissent in the civil rights cases of 1883, which Frederick Douglass wrote to him, called it the greatest opinion in legal history that should be spread like autumn leaves over all of the United States. But after Plessy v. Ferguson, at this terrible dark moment for African-American rights, people immediately spotted Harlan's dissent as a beacon. When Harlan died in 1911, John Marshall Harlan was memorialized in cities across the country where he had never visited, in black churches where there was no expectation that any white person would ever attend, but it was a spontaneous outpouring of grief for the one person they believed who had sort of kept the faith and had seen uh, the world through their eyes. Washington, D.C., there were three of these uh, spontaneous services culminating in a joint memorial service at Metropolitan AME where Harlan had actually visited and spoken many times. And at the service with thousands of people, all black in, in attendance, his dissents uh, in racial cases were read aloud. And if you put yourself in the mind of the children who were there, the, or the young people, the college age people who were there, hearing Harlan's words, the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. There is no caste here. If those words were deeply inspiring, among the people they inspired in a slightly later generation were Thurgood Marshall, who had to go 
in the 1930s and 40s to communities in the South and persuade people to be plaintiffs for lawsuits to overturn legalized segregation. His only argument to them was Harlan's dissent in Plessy, that it, there was any possibility of success. These plaintiffs knew that the Ku Klux Klan was out there wanting to kill them to ch for challenging segregation. They were risking their lives, and they had to know that it was worthwhile. And Harlan's uh, belief in, in uh, I mean, Thurgood Marshall's belief in Harlan's dissent in, in uh, Plessy v. Ferguson was such that it was called his Bible, that he used it to recruit plaintiffs. It was also included in all the NAACP Legal Defense Fund briefs that challenged segregation leading up to Brown versus Board of Education, which overturned segregation. Likewise, Harlan's dissents in some of those economic cases, remember the income tax being declared unconstitutional, his dissent was read in the well of the House of Representatives by Cordell Hall, a young congressman who fought valiantly for a constitutional amendment to allow the income tax to pass, to overturn the Supreme Court. Harlan's dissents in other cases, the E.C. Knight case, which was the one that declared the Sherman Antitrust Act unconstitutional, eventually persuaded some of his own colleagues to over. He started as a lone dissenter. Within 15 years, the Supreme Court had reversed itself. It's one example of him actually persuading people to change their minds. So in his dissents, John Marshall Harlan not only upheld crucial principles for the United States, including the foundational principle of equality under the law, he also charted a path to a better world where those decisions were eventually overturned. He inspired people and led the civil rights, and to, to lead a civil rights uh, revolution in the mid 20th century. He was the progenitor of all of that. And there's something very, very powerful and symbolically important about the notion of the lone dissenter, the one man against many, the one person who's willing to sort of stick by his views when everybody else is making a pragmatic compromise. All of those uh, corporate attorneys who had been appointed to the court uh, and his, his judicial colleagues were essentially doing what they believed. They believed strongly in free enterprise, and even though there was really no justification in the Supreme Court for many of their economic decisions, they thought they were you know, preserving America's economic future, but their decisions weren't really based on much and have been repudiated by history. On the race cases, I think they also had something of an economic motive. I think they felt that the country had just paid too big a price for its racial disputes and that some degree of peace with the South had to be made. And so they pragmatically threw out uh, the principle of equal protection, uh, sort of rationalizing, well, you know, slavery's ended, we've done what we can, now we have to keep the South happy to allow this economic engine to keep on humming. Uh, I think that was in their mind. But I think Harlan, again, stood for the Supreme Court, uh, stood for the, for the highest principles of the Supreme Court and also for the, the core values of the Constitution at this, this terribly dark moment. So that's why I think that all of you at Center College should not only be proud of Harlan's legacy and should continue to honor it the way that, the way that you do, but also should look at him as a role model and an example of somebody who stood by his values even when everyone else was going in a different direction, who understood innately because of what he saw in the Civil War and the lead up to the Civil War, the, the vital importance of these Supreme Court decisions. You know, once you've, once you've stepped over bodies at Shiloh, you can't go and sort of take a go along, get along opinion with your colleagues. And if you think a decision's wrong and is gonna create terrible hardship in this country, you have to stand up and say so. Those are among the many lessons that we can take from John Marshall Harlan's career. And I say once again, I'm honored to be among people who do appreciate Harlan in a place that was important to Harlan's development and uh, a place where hopefully he will continue to be uh, the hero that he should be. So thank you very much and I welcome any questions. I don't know how much time we have, but welcome any questions, thank you. Perfect, that's perfect. Uh, do we, do people have microphones there and want to go down and check it out? There they are. <laughs>
one, yeah, one person's going upstairs. Yeah, it's a little hard to hear, so we'll say, there's a man, there's a gentleman here. Justice Harlan was a strict constructionist or a loose constructionist. And to, I think, ask the question another way, did he uh, think that legislation should be created only by legislatures, or did he believe that judicial legislation was proper? Well, that's a great question. That's a great question. And uh, for all that he is famous for standing up for African-American rights in cases like Plessy v. Ferguson, which would have overturned a, a law that had been passed by the Louisiana legislature, I think that his greater inclination, which was visible in the economic cases, was to provide uh, more leeway to, to the legislature. You know, he articulated uh, a view of, um, uh, you know, judicial intervention in, uh, in legislative uh, affairs that is very comparable to the state of the law today. Uh, I'm not the expert. We have some judges here who can tell us that. But, you know, he essentially believed that unless a case, unless a law was plainly unconstitutional, that there should be deference to the legislative branches. I think that part of his experience growing up in Kentucky was, uh, and part of his, his core belief in democracy was that he believed that Congress and state legislatures should have enough power to really grapple with serious national problems and that the courts should not be tying the hands of the legislature and rushing in to replace uh, judicial judgment with that of the elected branches. And it pained him greatly that, you know, during the Gilded Age, the uh, the people of the United States supported something like the Sherman Antitrust Act, which passed unanimously, by the way, <laughs> through Congress. Uh, and they supported the income tax, and it was the Supreme Court stepping in to say, no, these essentially these rich justices, you know, finding very flimsy pretexts to say no. Uh, so I think that, you know, his, his strong inclination is that we should defer to the political branches whenever possible, but he also believed that, you know, the Constitution was the sovereign. So in the insular cases, which we haven't talked about, when the United States took over uh, Hawaii and the Philippines and Puerto Rico, and there was a tremendous sort of national requiem on what the legal status of these people in what are essentially American colonies should be, he led the forces that said the Constitution should follow the flag and that they should have full constitutional rights. And he led the forces because, um, you know, he believed that uh, you couldn't have one group of people living under the Constitution, one place where the Constitution is sovereign in the continental United States, and then another group of people, also Americans, who are uh, living under a cobbled together system by Congress and the courts. And he felt like the Constitution should always be the sovereign. So he would say that, you know, core constitutional rights like equal protection, of course, judges should intervene to enforce those. But as a principle, the democratic branches, the political branches, you know, had to have enough power and freedom from judicial interference to, to really grapple with national problems. Other questions, anyone upstairs? Yeah, they're, they're, that's a great question, but uh, but I think the the answer, sadly, is that they uh, there's nobody who's like Harlan. Both sides, liberals and conservatives, admire Harlan. So you have people like Justice Gorsuch uh, and Justice Roberts, who are, are avowed Harlan fans, and Justice Ginsburg, who is a Harlan fan, and others. You know, people who are perceived as conservatives, centrists, and and liberals all admire Harlan. But they don't really uh, replicate all of the, you know, the total picture of, of Harlan. And I've said that you know, conservatives tend to admire the fact that Harlan's, Harlan stood up for what they saw as the original intent and the plain meaning of the 14th Amendment in, in the race cases. You know, equal, protection and, you know, well, equal protection does not mean separate but equal, it means equal. You know? And that's the way a lot of conservatives feel the Constitution should be uh, interpreted in, in very clear, concrete terms. Uh, 
Many liberals will look at Harlan's positions and say, this is a man who always wrote about how a, a Supreme Court decision would affect average people and how it would affect the trajectory of the United States, the greater historical trajectory of the United States. And this is the kind of you know, in-touch humanistic judging that liberals tend to admire. And I've often said that you know, if people on either side kind of understood what it is that both of them admire about Harlan and acknowledge that the, what the other people admired about Harlan also had merit, you know, we'd get a little bit closer in some of these, uh, some of these disputes. But I don't, I don't believe that there is a Harlan on the court right now. Other questions? Uh, one here. This is a question as much of to, you, to you and about you as the biographer uh, oh, as it is about Harlan. <laughs> but you were researching and writing this during another very tumultuous period in America when some of the same issues and attitudes that were uh, around in Harlan's day were, were back. And I just was wondering, number one, what lessons and relevance of uh, Harlan's life did you think about as uh, you wrote as applicable uh, today and and your own uh, personal experience with Harlan as you got to know him against this modern backdrop. Well, um, I <clears throat> you know I personally admired Harlan since reading his his uh, dissents in law school thirty plus years ago. Um, I also became intrigued by him when I first learned about Robert Harlan in two thousand and five, and felt like. This was a case of a man's life experiences influencing his uh, decisions on the court, and um, uh, this is an interesting, uh, you know, an interesting story and a way to explore where the roots of wisdom in judging are, you know, and what the true roots of wisdom in judging are. So I think those lessons are all uh, very apparent in the in the Harlan story and things to take away in terms of it being uh, directly relevant at this at this particular moment. Um, I, I do think there's some parallels between uh, this era and the 1890s, and we've certainly seen that uh, there have been a lot of books and a lot of sudden, a sudden attention to the 1890s. Uh, and there's some people like the, uh, the Boston College historian, Heather Cox Richardson, who said, we're reliving the 1890s right now. Um, you know, I'm not sure it's going to play out exactly the way it did in the 1890s, and I'm not prepared to say that the current day Supreme Court is just like the court that Harlan was on. Um, but I do think there are some parallels and there are some, some risks. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's obvious that one of the reasons that, that Harlan's story strikes a chord today is because, you know, we're grappling with some of the same questions of, of equality under the law, but also uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, imbalances in society uh, and trying to find the right path just like, uh, just like Harlan did. Um, when having to dissent throughout his career, did his opinion of the court's power ever change or his position just of like the Supreme Court within the federal government change, such as the court being too powerful in overruling, I don't know, Congress's decision like Sherman Antitrust Act, so on and so forth? Uh, I didn't catch everything you said. I think you're wearing your mask. Just take your mask for one second. <laughs> one second. When dissenting throughout his career, uh, did his position and or opinion of the Supreme Court's power ever change, such as like um, overruling congressional decisions and legislation? Uh -huh. so, so the power of the courts over Congress is basically mm -hmm. in that kind of thing. I think that, you know, <clears throat> he um, uh, being named for John Marshall, you know, he was a believer in the primacy of law over politics and support of law over politics. But as uh, I said in answer to the question earlier before, he also was a strong believer in American democracy and in the, uh, uh, the, the importance of particularly a, uh, a federal legislature, the U.S. Congress, being able to grapple with U.S. problems. Um, he was honored by a group of Kentuckians in, uh, I think it was 1905, somewhere in 1905. It was actually at the Plaza Hotel. There was a, uh, in New York. But there was, you know, Kentucky staged a, a big, you know, we, you know, celebrate our great uh, favorite son, John Marshall Harlan. And he began his speech by saying, you know, I am so proud to be a citizen of Kentucky. And then he said, but what would it mean to be a citizen of Kentucky if we were not first and foremost citizens of the United States? 
that I think, uh, uh, you know, ca encapsulates his, his attitude towards, uh, uh, towards, towards the U.S. Congress and uh, his, his belief in the primacy of federal leadership and federal uh, legislation. Another person. Good evening. Hi. Um, apart from like his influences, like um, Robert Holland, what would you say his main motivations were when he was writing like the dissent pieces? Because like you mentioned that he was usually under enormous pressure, like for unanimous decisions. So would you say he was thinking about the future and like the potential of like people using his words for like movements, or would you say he did it just because he thought he was right, or because of some other motivations? I think that when he was when he was um, talking about the future in his in his uh, decisions and the importance of considering the the uh, uh, the role, uh, you know, the the effect of a U.S. Uh, Supreme Court decision on the future. He was thinking in his mind about the Dred Scott decision, which he felt had all these unintended consequences, that it was a decision that could have been narrowly decided where the Supreme Court just kind of went well beyond its mandate and created a terrible situation for the country. In some of the cases that were considered like real abominations in his time and the dissents that he felt most strongly about, he would always compare them to the Dred Scott decision. And what he meant, he would always invoke Dred Scott when he would talk about like the terrible unintended consequences. So in the income tax decision, he said that what would ever happen in a state of war with the Supreme Court having now declared an income tax unconstitutional, if the tariffs which were used to fund the government, which are dependent on trade, were to dry up, which would happen in a time of war, how would the United States defend itself? So he would ask these sort of practical kinds of questions about effect. You know, the racial example is in Plessy v. Ferguson. He included lines where he said, what can more uh, assuredly create a state of tension uh, between the races than a state enactment that proceeds upon the assumption that black people are so degraded they can't, they can't stay in the same railroad cars as white people? So he was predicting racial strife in the future and thinking about racial strife. So I think that, you know, that goes a little bit beyond the idea of, you know, strict construction of uh, interpretation of the Constitution. But I think he believed that it was part of your judicial responsibility to sort of understand what you were doing, that you're not just, you know, robotically applying uh, certain doctrines, that you're trying to settle cases that are of real importance to real people and that will help shape the United States in the future. So I think that's what he meant when he would talk about, you know, what, what these cases would mean in the future. Oops, <laughs> one more. Well, first, Mr. Canales, as founder of the John Marshall Harlan Society of Law here on campus, thank you for coming. Thank it you. Means, <laughs> it means the world to my society and me especially. But I wanted to ask, how do you think we're supposed to take the dissonance of his views towards Asian Americans and African Americans, which I think is a topic that's often overlooked on Harlan? So wait, so the topic of what? Of so he's, you know, he's for, you know, justice for African Americans, but he also, I think he wrote somewhere in one of his dissents that, you know, he does not consider Asian Americans equal to other Americans. You, are you talking about Chinese cases? Is yeah, that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a, a critique of, of Justice Harlan that has some merit, and certainly any person can make their own judgment about it. There's a line in his uh, dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson where he says, uh, there's a race so different from our own, I'm speaking of the Chinese race, that we do not, uh, we exclude them from the country because they had recently passed the Chinese exclusion law, which uh, stopped uh, Chinese migration under a particular treaty. He said, but they are uh, allowed to travel in the white car uh, and African Americans are not. Now, some people interpret that line as Harlan saying that he agreed with the exclusion of uh, Chinese people. But I think that his intent in writing it was pretty clear that he was speaking to his fellow justices and to the white community in saying, look, the state of Louisiana says that this is separate but equal, that everyone's being treated equally, black people in one car, white people in another car. But in fact, the purpose is to separate out black people because 
Chinese people aren't separated out. Other races aren't separated out. They're allowed to travel in the same car as white people. He was trying to discern the underlying intent of the Louisiana car law, which was not to be equal. It was to exclude African Americans. Beyond the, uh, that one language in, um, uh, that one line in his Plessy descent, um, he never really wrote himself about uh, Chinese Americans, except in, in one case where he dissented in favor of Chinese Americans when the Supreme Court denied them access to, to the, uh, denied uh, uh, civil rights protections to the Chinese in a terrible case in California where a gang of whites had terrorized a group of Chinese people, and Harlan actually dissented in support of Chinese. He also, however, joined a nine to nothing opinion that rejected a challenge to the Chinese Exclusion Act. And the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, was in response to a, a treaty that Congress had passed and the president had signed that allowed Chinese uh, workers to come into the United States while maintaining uh, their Chinese citizenship and being subjects of the Chinese emperor. Um, and they came during the gold rush largely to provide extra manual labor in, China, in California um, and would sort of come and go. Uh, we, a couple of uh, decades after the gold rush, the labor situation had changed completely in California and there was tremendous prejudice against Chinese and Chinese were being scapegoated for economic problems and it was, it was a terrible situation for Chinese in, in California. And Congress stepped in and ordered an end to Chinese migration. All of it had been under this one treaty where Chinese were coming here not as citizens and not even in hopes of becoming citizens. They were still Chinese citizens, but they were here to work. Um, the challenge to the Chinese Exclusion Act was that uh, lawyers argued for that you could not abrogate a treaty once it had been ratified by, by the Senate. So think of the implications of that. You know, there are all kinds of treaties, nuclear arms treaties and things like that, and that you can't, Congress can't step in and pull out of these treaties. That was essentially the argument that was being made in this case called Che Chen Ping. The Supreme Court rejected that argument nine to nothing, and most people, it's still good law today, everybody would sort of say yes, on that, that narrow legal grounds, uh, Congress has to have the power to abrogate a treaty. The opinion that was written by Justice Stephen Field, who was from California, was not a, uh, uh, an admirable piece of legal work. It was something that had a lot of gratuitous language about how the people of California recognize that Chinese can never assimilate among white people and things like that. It was a not, a, it was a, you know, had plenty of racist language in it. And Harlan was one of the nine justices who signed on to the holding. He did not write that opinion. Now, personally, if you ask me, I would say, given that Harlan was courageous enough to dissent in all of these cases, you know, maybe he could have written a concurrence in that case where he would say, look, on the narrow legal ground, I'm, I'm with you, but I don't appreciate Justice Fields' uh, uh, gratuitous uh, dicta in this, in this opinion. Um, nonetheless, it was not a, uh, a wrong legal decision. You know, people today, left and right would say, even uh, Jack Chin, who I know has come and spoken here and who was very helpful in my book and is uh, a great legal scholar of, of, uh, of the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, even he would say that it was not wrongly decided on the facts, but the opinion was objectionable. Uh, there's one other case where Harlan joined a dissent of, uh, that Justice Fuller had in a case where um, a person who had been a baby born in the United States but grew up in China, tried to assert birthright citizenship later on. Um, and Harlan agreed with a fuller dissent, again, he didn't write it, but it was a fuller dissent that said, since there was no intention on the part of the Chinese parents ever to become a citizen or ever a chance for them to become a citizen, they should deny birthright citizenship to, to this uh, Chinese baby who was born, this Chinese man who had been born 30 years earlier uh, uh, on, you know, in the United States. I think that's a debatable decision also. He did, however, give a lecture after that where he defended the decision, but not in reference to Chinese. He quickly talked about the British. He said, what if there's a British couple who came to Hot Springs on vacation and had a child who was a British subject with no intention of that child ever becoming an American citizen, and then they end their vacation and they go home, 
And 30 years later, that person, because it gets involved in some sort of dispute and calls on the United States to defend them as a US citizen, you know, there are serious implications in these things. What was interesting about the lecture is that Harlan tried to deracinate the, the decision. He tried to sort of say, you know, I'm questioning birthright citizenship because I feel like people who are subjects to a foreign power should not be getting US citizenship just automatically because of an accident of, of birth. But he's making it clear that he did not intend this to be a, 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 a slur against the Chinese particularly, but it was a view against anybody, including British, who, uh, who came here for a brief period of time and happened to be born here. The reason I think some of these distinctions are important is that Harlan really did uh, have a great legacy as a supporter of equal protection. He wrote a decision in a crucial Native American case. He wrote a dissent in a, national, uh, a, a case involving a, a Native American who left his tribal uh, lands and tried to assert birthright citizenship of his own in the United States. And Harlan said, yes, of course, he should get it. The rest of the court said, no, he shouldn't <laughs> in a very racist decision. He also, when we talked about the Insular cases, was the lead justice saying that there should be full constitutional rights for Hawaiians and Filipinos. So to say, aha, he was biased against the Chinese on racial grounds, I think is mistaken. I don't believe that he was, you know, if you look at the totality of the evidence that he was, you know, an anti-Chinese um, hater, uh, but supportive of every other racial minority, including all the other Asian racial minorities. I, I don't think that follows. I think that what does follow is that his belief in American exceptionalism, in the uniqueness of American democracy, extended to a skepticism of people who lived under authoritarian governments. And it was also been noted that very early in his career, he expressed skepticism about Catholics and whether Catholics who were beholden to the Pope and obliged through papal infallibility to believe that the Pope's word was God, you know, could they function in a democratic society? Now, he later repudiated those views and talked about how heroically Catholics fought in his regiment in the Civil War and how he would never question a man's religion. Nonetheless, early in his career, he did question uh, the ability of, of Catholics to be loyal to the United States while also being loyal to the Pope. So I think there was a strain that I certainly think was a little excessive uh, of anti-foreign feeling, you know, that related to his strong belief that self-government is a crucial experiment here in the United States. And we have to be mindful of people who have loyalty to these monarchs overseas. And I think when he thought of the cases of some of the Chinese uh, plaintiffs who remained subject to the Chinese emperor, he's thinking these people are not US citizens, they are subjects of the Chinese emperor. Um, and some of that feeling like, wait a minute, these people may not be able to you know, fully function as US uh, citizens or as, as uh, members of the you know, US uh, polity. Um, I, I think that some of those feelings were echoing in his mind. I don't think that he was like a rank anti-foreigner or hater or anything like that, but he had a skepticism of foreigners that probably went beyond what we today would feel or, or, or consider noble. And I think that was behind his joining those two opinions. They didn't write, he just joined those two opinions uh, that, uh, uh, that expressed skepticism about Chinese. But, um, you know, then against that is the case where he went out of his way to dissent to say that uh, the civil rights of Chinese workers had been violated in California by a white mob and that uh, the local authorities were wrong not to invoke the Civil Rights Act, the local Civil Rights Act. So, um, you know, not everybody has a perfect record. It's mixed. I think it's entirely fair to say that he's, he's not a hero to the Chinese in the same way that he's a hero to African Americans or Native Americans or uh, other uh, people abroad who are under the US uh, control. Um, but I, I don't think it's right to say that he was an enemy of the Chinese or, a, a, you know, particular, uh, particularly biased against the Chinese. One more question. 
I finished your book yesterday. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great read, and I encourage anyone who hasn't read it to go to your public library or, or better yet, for you to uh, go online and, and order a copy. Um, what I thought was very interesting was at the very end, uh, in your acknowledgments, and that there were so many, and what it looked like was that there were so many people who worked for so long in doing the research on this. Is this the norm? And that, because it seemed like, you know, I've read a lot of biographies, but I've never seen an acknowledgement that was so extensive as the one that you had. Uh, and I see, and I know that you've written other biographies. Is is that the norm, or or, or was this a, a little bit well, more? Well, I mean, I had um, I had uh, for three years, I had two people working full time, not always the same two people, uh, working full time as researchers for me, and it was very very helpful, particularly for online research. Uh, because I'm of a generation <laughs> where I'm not exactly a genius at finding the you know, obscure publications that are, uh, that are online in, in stray libraries around the country. Uh, so I was very privileged to have uh, primarily two young people. One, uh, a journalist who's now working a report for America in North Dakota who was with me for three years and who spent did, did the bulk of the research into Robert Harlan's life. Uh, and even we were talking about the Kentucky Historical Society and how Adam is still well remembered there and still remembered all around Kentucky. And I had invited to pay for him to come, come down and join me on this trip, but he was away for a family reason and wasn't able to come. Uh, and I also had a, a researcher who was full time for me for a year and then went to law school at the University of Virginia and just graduated, but wrote sort of an epic memo sort of charting all of the progression of civil rights law, not Plessy, but the other civil rights laws and the development of civil rights law and Harlan's role in it, which is just a genius. He was a, an undergraduate who had a, a sort of preternatural interest in, in Harlan and an interest in the law. And so I was very lucky to have him working with me as well. Uh, what was great about it is that it, it replicated for me, who spent a lot of my career as an editor, it replicated some of that relationship. So I had colleagues and people, you know, working and um, uh, helping me who would like come to my house at 9 a.m. Uh, we'd talk for an hour about like the Harlan research and what we had discovered that day. And then I would go to work because I continued working during some of this time. And it enabled me to sort of keep the amount of time that I took away from work to, to work really on the writing of the book. So for nine months, I worked straight through. I, I took off from work and I worked, wrote the book straight through. But you know, like people talk about raising a child, it takes a village and the role of Adam Willis, who was the, the researcher who was with me for three years and Alec Ward, who was with me for one year on civil rights law, along with many, many other people, including a lot of people in Kentucky, local historians, you mentioned Jim Clotter, somebody was mentioning today was a great help. Jack Chin was a great help. He was the author of the uh, Law Review article about Harlan's views on the Chinese. It was highly critical of Harlan's views on the Chinese, but he also helped. He read the, mem the manuscript and made some nice suggestions. Um, and there were, you know, I had the help of a photo editor who was able to get the rights to a lot of these pictures that were in it. So it, it definitely was a group, a group effort. <laughs> so anyway. Thanks. I thought I'd also give a quick shout out to our librarians here and our archivist, Beth Absolutely. Morgan. Absolutely. <laughs> Beth Morgan. Is Beth Morgan around here anywhere? I don't think she's here. But she was a great help, uh, first of all, to, to when I was here, but also a great help to Adam when he was here. So, absolutely. Uh, so, yes, please, uh, please read the acknowledgments as closely <laughs> as you did. <laughs> It's not, by the way, what you're saying is this unusual. It's not, un, it's not unusual. Read like, if you read Doris Kearns Goodwin's books, she has like 20 people working on them. So it's, uh, and then nor is there, is there anything wrong with it. I, I would have loved to have uh, even more help. You know, I really would. Thank you. Thank you.